Hey, this is Mike Masha Cadwallader. Thanks for tuning in to Fund Finance Friday Industry Conversations. I hope everybody had a good Juneteenth and Father's Day last weekend. Uh, I was lucky and got up to Smith Mountain Lake in Virginia and got to visit with my parents and be with my pops on Father's Day. And my kids and I did redeem ourselves fishing. Uh, we caught some really nice fish on the lake up there. Uh, if anybody in Fund Finance on vacation this summer catches a better fish, send me the pic uh, and we'll get it up. Relatively active week in fund finance. Uh, we saw in the U.S. $2 billion plus transactions close this week, uh, both for top tier sponsors, but they were club deals, not broadly syndicated. So lenders are still taking meaningful positions in new deals. Uh, our pace has moderated a good bit since the crush of March and uh, April, uh, but still relatively robust and in excess of our trailing 12 month rolling average. Uh, the Fund Finance Association held its sponsors call this week. Uh, relatively good news there too, kind of uneventful. Uh, people did report really good deal flow uh, and nobody reported any transaction uh, with credit distress. So, so relatively positive update. Uh, Jennifer Choi from ILPA did join the call and gave some background uh, and feedback that they've been getting on the guidance on subscription facility disclosure that they put out about two weeks ago now. Uh, nothing there that I thought would be materially impactful for the, for the market as a whole. Uh, additionally, on that call, Nick Mitra did announce that the FFA uh, is moving the London and the Asia conferences to virtual. It's just going to be too hard to execute an in-person uh, event this fall. And so we are asking for feedback uh, for suggestions on how we can make these virtual conferences as productive as possible. Uh, so with that background, uh, let's turn to our visitors. Great. So first with us today is Pratap Dasgupta, who's a managing director at Macquarie and one of the leaders of their fund finance business. Pratap, good to see you, man. Thanks for joining us. Mike, thanks for having me. You bet. You and your family holding up all right? We're doing just fine. We're outside the city, so you know we've been safe so far, uh, looking to get through the summer. How about yourself? Yeah, we're doing great. We're doing great. Thanks. It's uh, a little bit easier in suburbia for sure. So, you know, you and I have known each other a long time, but for the market, give us a little background on the segment uh, of fund finance that Macquarie focuses on. Sure. So Macquarie Group is a global financial services firm. We operate in 31 markets. Uh, our fund finance activity uh, has been around for about 20 years. We've been in the U.S. for nearly a decade and recently entered Europe as well. We draw on our industry expertise to offer innovative solutions to our clients. We cover a broad selection of alternative asset managers covering products such as short-term liquidity solutions to term financing. Um, our focus is on not financing, but we also offer some commitment back facilities, which are typically non-standard, as well as some GP financing. And then over the last sort of eight to nine years, our client base has largely been the secondary funds. We've also more recently got traction with the primary funds, uh, namely on the buyout, private credit, real estate, and infrastructure side. Mm -hmm. You guys have always been one of the leaders in the financing of secondary space. When COVID hit, I sort of expected there to be a little bit more activity from a trading standpoint in secondaries, but it seemed pretty quiet. Has that been changing at all? I think uh, if you look back to last year, the, the activity and the volumes were pretty strong. And I think that momentum carried over into this year, right, up, right until March. I think a number of processes went on pause in March. The secondary managers are not actually sitting on the sidelines. They're still being quite active trying to provide liquidity to the LPs. Uh, these are not true sales, but more structured transactions, uh, preferred equity style arrangements or sharing of cash flows. We've also seen some secondary managers trying to fundraise as well. There's anticipation there's a lot of volume that's gonna come into the market. So everyone's yeah. getting ready. And then from an existing portfolio perspective, when you think about the market, you know, what, what are you all forecasting market wide when second quarter marks come out on all the secondary positions that are backing all of the credit facilities? Yeah, so we're not really trying to forecast the market right now. 
the general sentiment seems to be the second quarter figures should not be a surprise to anyone. You know, we've had a significant portion of the economy virtually shut down in April and a good part of May. It's difficult right now to determine how strong the recovery is going to be based on the Q2 numbers. I think buyers will get good visibility on growth come September. That's the time when the second quarter numbers will become available. And if that all sort of is supported, then I think volumes will pick up in the fourth quarter this year. Looking beyond, I think if you look into next year and the years uh, after that, I think volumes will go back to the pre-COVID levels, even exceed those levels. There are a number of LPs who need to rebalance their portfolios, but they are waiting on the sidelines for pricing to become attractive again. Mm -hmm. And how are you all thinking about the market from a uh, volume perspective on the financing side? Yeah, we've, we've had a number of conversations with market participants post-COVID. And financing, I think, will continue to be used to bridge the gap between the buyers and the sellers. Um, LIBOR rates have come down, so that's, that's really helpful. It's going to offset some of the increase in the margin that may be there. But the overall borrowing cost is still going to be pretty attractive. There's also a lot of capacity in the market, so banks still have appetite to provide this type of financing. So even when volumes do pick up, I think financing will be there. The one exception is the cash distribution side. That has been slowing down in recent years. With COVID, I think there's going to be a further slowdown. A number of businesses will need to adapt to the change, so exits will be pushed back a bit. So from a financing perspective, I do foresee there will be requests from borrowers for longer term facilities, right? And, you know, we are hopeful that, you know, some of the advance rates might be a tick lower, making it lender friendly as well at the same time. Yeah. Switching to the NAV market, I mean, there's just been a ton of press on NAV based lending. I think there are four articles that we've uh, cited in Fund Finance Friday today alone. What, what are you all seeing in the NAV lending market? Yeah, you know, one would have thought we wouldn't be as busy, but we've been pretty busy. Uh, we're seeing a lot of requests for NAV financing. I'm going to break it up into three categories. The first one is with primary funds. These are prior vintage funds. They've largely invested the capital they have raised. They still need to put some capital to work uh, towards follow-ons for playing offense and defense. It's not really leverage they're looking for. They're looking for bridging between their current capital needs and exits that are two to three years away. So the bank financing product is there for them. It's cheaper, but it has covenants. It has security requirements in comparison to an alternative, which is private equity, uh, secondaries who might provide a preferred equity solution. So we are also seeing financing requests where existing lenders are pulling back. Uh, some of these might require us to look at both the commitments and the assets. And then the third bucket is really providing financing solutions to the LPs. A lot of these LPs rely on recycling distributions they receive from existing investments and applying them towards you know, future investments they look to make. So as distributions are getting pushed out into the future, they're looking for short to medium term liquidity solutions. Yeah, that's great. That's great. What what else? Any other uh, things you all forecast or market developments you could update the market on? Sure, Mike. Um, you know, there's a lot of dry powder that's waiting to get invested. So, you know, that's that's a big positive. The public markets are projecting a strong bounce back. There's policy support from the government, so that's all a very encouraging sign for the for the market. There are certain risks still in the market. We've got COVID. We've got elevated levels of corporate debt in the face of uncertain growth. We've got the U.S. elections and some external noise, China trade talks, etc. Notwithstanding all of this uncertainty, I think Macquarie Fund Finance is pretty well placed. We underwrite both the assets and the commitments and can be flexible in providing clients with solutions to meet their needs. We also have access to a pretty strong balance sheet with ample funding and capital to support our activity and our clients. Great, great. Well, switching gears with you, uh, has your family been playing a lot of tennis? You have, you have two kids, right? I do, and, and you know, we've been, my wife and I have been playing a fair bit. Uh, the kids are reluctant tennis players, but they, they know it's a requirement to be in the family. 
And uh, so, so we try to get them out every day um, and hoping that they, they get better. Excellent. Excellent. Well, listen, I really appreciate you uh, joining us. It was good to see you, man. And uh, thanks for making time. Mike, thanks for having me. So next we have with us Rich Young. Rich is an associate in the fund finance group in our New York office at Cadwallader, also a Harvard law grad. And uh, last week he called me to let me know that today would be his last day. Uh, Rich, say it isn't so. <laughs> I'll miss it. I'll miss it. But it, it's true, Mike. It's true. Yeah. So I had you on today because I want to get the entire market to peer pressure you to stay with Cadwallader. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm thrilled for you. It's a great opportunity. Tell everybody a, bit, a little bit about the job you're transitioning to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks again for uh, having me uh, on, Mike. I am going to Citibank to be the deputy staff to the CFO in the office of the CFO. Uh, pretty excited about it. It's a different opportunity for me, uh, an opportunity to sort of see how uh, a global organization like Citigroup sort of works and thinks and its challenges and, and, and opportunities. So very much so looking forward to it, although I will miss my time uh, at CWT and you guys dearly. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, look, now you've been uh, an investment banker in a leveraged finance group. You've been an attorney in a funds finance group, and you're going on to be a chief of staff <laughs> in the post office. It's a pretty good resume you're putting together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that the consistent thread is finance, though, right? So my, my work has always been around uh, finance and I guess consistently working with really good people. So I've been lucky. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you for all you've done for our team. You've been a wonderful lawyer with us. You've been great for our clients. Uh, we really appreciate everything you've done. You're going to do great in this new role and we'll certainly miss you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and thanks to all of the team. You guys have been great. Uh, it's just, it's been an absolute pleasure. Everyone I've worked with has been so hardworking and thoughtful and I, I've loved it and I'm sad to go, but this isn't sort of goodbye forever. It's see you later in a different capacity. Sounds good. Don't be a stranger. Thanks for joining us, Ray. Thanks, Mike. Great. So next we have with us Michelle Bolingbrook, who is a longtime volunteer for the Funds Finance Association and previously the head of biz dev for both Appleby and Arnie's in the Cayman Islands. Michelle, how are you doing? Thanks for joining us. I'm wonderful. Thanks so much for having me, Mike. You bet. You bet. Things in the Cayman Islands holding up okay? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been pretty tough on the lockdown front, but we're starting to ease on the restrictions, which is fantastic. Um, I have a 16-month-old son here at home, and so it's been wonderful to spend lots of time with him, um, but it's nice to have play dates again. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Is the weather at least good? The weather's fantastic. We're actually a little cloudy uh, the last few days with the Sahara dust um, cloud that's covering the Caribbean at the moment, but... Um, it's actually a nice change from all day sunny. That's great. Well, listen, you just accepted a new role with the Funds Finance Association. G give everybody a little update about what you're going to be doing. Yeah, I, I mean, I've been involved with Fund Finance basically since it launched, um, actually before it launched as part of Applebee. Um, and then I helped the board create uh, Fund Finance Association and their website initially and helped organize their first conference before it was outsourced to Sequence. Um, so re it's really exciting to have a more formal uh, role with the association and I'm really excited about that opportunity. Um, I'll be working closely with the board to continue to meet their initiatives and work on some new initiatives for WFF, Fund Finance University and NextGen. Terrific, terrific. And you're, uh, how, how will the sponsors see you and how, how will they uh, be more involved with you? Yeah, I mean, so FFA is still going to have a really good relationship with Sequence. They've played such a massive role in the growth of the association. Um, my role is going to be working closely with the board and Sequence to make sure everything's a little bit more streamlined for the sponsors. Um, and then we'll make sure that we deliver, especially in this new world of digital conferences, make sure that we're continuing to bring and deliver value to sponsors um, until things get back to normal. I've got a lot of work to be done on Fund Finance University. I hope you're going to help me. I am. That's the yeah. plan. Yeah, I'm looking great. forward to it. Good, good. Me too. Well, listen, welcome. We're glad to have you at the FFA. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's going to be great. 
I'm really excited about this opportunity. Thanks for joining us, Michelle. Thanks for having me, Mike. Great. So next we have with us Ken Bigelow, who's the managing partner of Psionic, which is a software and technology solutions provider. I'm always excited when entrepreneurs get interested in the funds finance space. Uh, so I wanted to have Ken join us. Ken, welcome. How you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. You bet. You bet. Tell us a little bit about Psionic. Yeah, Psionic is actually a global consulting firm um, focused on and dedicated to actually the financial services uh, vertical. We have about 350 staff and associates in about a dozen offices in North America, Europe, and, uh, and Tokyo. We do, like I said, consulting for, um, for both the buy side and the sell side. We also have a learning and development practice where we help to groom upcoming executives and help them with their career um, career choices. And uh, where I'm focused is in is on the software side, where uh, where we're looking to partner with innovative new technology firms to bring technology solutions to our clients, so we enhance beyond just giving consulting uh, consulting advice. Great. And how did you learn about fund finance? Yeah, it's a, it goes back a ways. So for about uh, 10 years, I was the uh, CIO. I ran a technology in the U.S. for, uh, for West LB. And during that time, West LB was, a, uh, was an early participant, actually probably an innovator in the subscription finance product and in fund finance. Um, so my internal client at the time was Didi Sklar, who I'm sure your listeners are, are familiar with. And sure. Didi, came, Didi came to me and said, uh, I need a system. Credit is not going to allow me to expand this portfolio without a system. So we built a very quick system. Uh, didn't do too much, but then over time we expanded it and talked with other other parts of the bank and and you know got deeper into it. And that's that's where I got my interest. And there's, you know, it's still still an interesting product. That's great. That's great. So tell us a little bit about the product and what's unique about it as a tool. Yeah. So. Um, you know, I think the key benefit of the product is is still what it was for Didi at the time. It's understanding the investors, right? And that's a, that's a unique thing across lending products, where what you're relying on to 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 make the loan is is an investor who's not necessarily a customer of the bank. And so, capturing that investor information, having some credit information about the investor, and being able to see that investor through the life of a number of deals and making sure that you understand this is the same investor across all these deals in your portfolio. So you can kind of risk assess your portfolio across the investors. Um, yeah, the, the other thing that I think is, is good about the product and really for us lending products in general is uh, uh, that they're very document based, right? And so document based because we're interested in, uh, in employing machine learning solutions in this case, that the fact that documents have such a big role in the product give us opportunities to employ machine learning so for some interesting use cases. So to my mind, that's, that's where we're trying to differentiate ourselves. Great. And then are banks your, your target market? Yeah, yes. At this point, banks are where we're focused, banks and lenders, but, but mainly the larger banks that are involved in the, uh, in the... Now, that's not to say that we wouldn't love to go to the other side, go to the sponsors or, or, or other people that could use the product. But right now, we're, we're helping the banks to understand their risk of, of the deals. Sure. And, and what are the key benefits of the tool? Yeah, I, I think that the, I think the ability to manage the portfolio all in one place and to link to your production lending system so that you can see the borrowing base and see where the, the condition of the borrowing base versus the draws and the facility that you have. So being able to get that missing piece of information, I think all of the banks today are using spreadsheets um, and spreadsheets are you know, prone to error. And so, and so you get the, the credit and the, and the risk departments appreciate the fact that there's, a, that there's a core system there that can really provide that information in a reliable way. Great. And so what's the, what, what stage of production and impl implementation is the product in right now? Yeah, we've, uh, we've rolled it out for a couple of banks. It's in production. Um, the portfolio management pieces of it are ready to go, right? We've, we've, we've built the ability to ingest borrowing base 
reports so that you can monthly or quarterly or as you receive these reports, update the exposure you have on existing deals to capture new deals, to capture deal structures, hurdle rates, uh, uh, the advance rates, the different, uh, the different aspects of the, of the subscription deals. We capture NAV deals as well. Um, and then evolving with the, uh, with the machine learning aspects. So the machine learning comes in where we automatically are matching investors and sort of enhancing that process so that you can, so that the, the, the lender can be sure an investor in this deal is the same or different and, and build that hierarchy. And then, and then what, where we're, where we're moving towards is being able to ingest more of the fund formation documents and understand the parameters of the key features of deals and then compare it to investor behavior to be able to see, you know, how is that impacting and, and can it improve how future deals are structured or how you're pricing deals. So that's, mm -hmm. that's sort of the newer piece that we're working on. That's great. That's great. Any other ways you think the tool is likely to evolve in the future? I think actually that um, that deeper, I mean, machine learning, I'm, we're going to rely on the market and the participants to tell us what interesting insights you can get out of really understanding these documents. And then I think as the market evolves towards more NAV deals and more interesting structures, and even if secondaries become something that, that, that it's important for us to capture, I think we would evolve in that way. But to me, the most interesting thing is that lending products in general can use these types of uh, these types of capabilities. So I would expect us to be expanding horizontally as well as vertically, right? So getting to some adjacent products, different lending products that have different challenges, and using the machine learning for that, and then also going downstream to you know in the functions, credit can can use some of the data that's in these, and and operations, loan operations can use some of this data as well. So I think there's a there's a great opportunity for us to expand from here. That's great. That's great. Well, Ken, listen, super to uh, have you with us. I wish you a ton of luck. And if we can do anything to be helpful, please call on us. Really appreciate it. Thanks for the time today. Great. Well, thanks for dialing in and listening to Industry Conversations today. Next week with the July 4th holiday uh, in the United States, we are going to take the week off. Uh, so we'll be back in two weeks and look forward to catching up with you then. If you have feedback on how we can make Industry Conversations more productive, please email me. The material and information contained in the podcast is for general informational purposes only. Any use of the audio within this podcast without the express consent of Cadwallader is prohibited. Quotes from this podcast may not be used without the express permission of the speaker.